Good morning. You know, being uh, fully disclosing, uh, this morning, as you gather, I, be, I am speaking at the 175th anniversary of the First Baptist Church in Tarrytown, New York. I was a pastor there from 1986 to 1996. And um, because of the speaking engagement and um, thinking through some of the things that I wanted to share with you this morning, I began reminiscing about those early days of my ministry. And in particular, of one day, Saturday, December 23rd, 1989. I began that day doing some Christmas shopping. I already had bought uh, Cindy uh, uh, you know, some presents, but I went up to the mall just to find some stocking stuffers. And so when I left the mall, um, I wasn't too surprised by the holiday traffic, but as I got about a half a mile away from where I lived, it was a long uh, decline, uh, this hill that, that just sloped all the way down towards the Hudson River. On the top of that hill, you had a beautiful view of the Tappan Zee Bridge. But as I approached that downward hill, it was totally backed up. And at first, I thought it was an accident because of the flashing lights of the police cars that were at the bottom of the hill. But the closer I got, I began to uh, see that it was something much more than that. I was, I usually, when you got to the bottom of the hill, I would make a right, and my car was, my, my, uh, my house was only about 400 feet uh, from that corner. But um, on that day, I was greeted by a barricade and an officer and uh, he was telling me that I had to turn left. At that moment, I was really aware that something was wrong because there was um, the smell of fire and you could see the clouds, uh, uh, you know, the, the fire just rising up uh, into the sky. And um, I leaned over and I said, where's the fire? And he said, I said, um, I, I need to get over there. I said, my home is about 400 feet. And he says, no, 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 it's not a home, it's a church. And I said, what church? And he said, it's the Baptist church. And I said, I'm the pastor of that church. And when I turned the corner, I saw it engulfed in flames. There are life experiences that shape who we are and how we face future challenges. This was one of those experiences. I sat in the living room of the parsonage early that morning, staring out on that Sunday morning, staring out at the smoldering remains of our church building. And I recall Cindy saying to me through tears, what are we going to do? It's Christmas Eve. Those who didn't hear about the fire will be arriving for church, and they're going to find it in ruin. People are, people are going to be so sad. What are you going to say? And I thought about that. In a few hours, we would be gathered together as a family. We would embrace one another. And I just remember all those tears and hugs. But in the morning hours, the Lord gave me a great text. And I felt confident. And I opened the scriptures and I read this passage from Isaiah chapter 61. It's a passage that Jesus used when he began his public ministry. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve. And then this passage just stuck out. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. See, when I began my ministry in Tarrytown, we started with 47 people. 27 over the age of 70. The congregation had grown a little bit since then, but not very much. We were only there about 18 months when the fire happened. 
And I remember thinking to myself in those days, how are we going to face these current difficulties? I mean, our resources were few, and the devastation was immense. The way forward wasn't really clear. But I remember in those early weeks, we got together and we prayed. And I felt that the Lord had, had said that our future was as bright as his promises. And so we took those words, our future is as bright as God's promises. And there was an artist in the congregation, and he drew them up on a four-by-eight sheet of plywood, and we put it right there on the front lawn of the church. And you know, as the years passed, we saw God do one miracle after another. You know, Bethany, as I looked at today's scripture, the Apostle Paul is offering a prayer on behalf of the Ephesian church, a prayer that God would provide a way for his people to develop a deeper walk with him. And he begins to explain through his prayer how that's even going to be possible because he begins to speak, speak about the truth that um, God is going to provide us with power so that we can face life's challenges. The truth in this passage will be enough to provide us with guidance in troubled times. The truth of this passage will transform ashes into a crown of beauty, mourning into the oil of gladness, and despair into a garment of praise. These truths, they have sustained me over and over since I began that ministry in 1986. And I am certain and confident that the words that we're going to look at this morning will also do that for you. So I want to ask you to turn into your sermon notes page where the passage is printed for you. And as we begin, I want you to recognize that from verse 15 all the way through 23 is another one of those long sentences in Greek. And so it, we begin to put a structure to these so that we could get a, a sense of what Paul is really saying. So let me begin at verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. You see how the text starts off, it says, for this reason. Well, what reason? It's a reminder to what Paul has stated in his opening doxology. It is a reminder that we have reason for praise. We have been blessed. God the Father has designed a plan to redeem this broken world. And he has built the foundation and ensures its completion. The work of God the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they show something of the full extent of his love, and that love is applied through time. When Paul says, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, don't those two words remind you of Jesus saying what the most important thing is? That we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. This vertical relationship with God needs to spill out in this horizontal love that I have for my brothers. Paul is beginning to see that in the churches here, in particular in Ephesians, and he says, I give thanks for that. And out of that, out of that uh, place of giving thanks, Paul turns around and says, I am also praying for you. I always love passages like this because they remind me that prayer and thanksgiving, they go together. Prayer is not only when things are dire, but prayer is also offered when things are a delight. Paul's prayer is going to demonstrate his understanding of God and God's ways, and in unfolding that, when we read about what Paul is really asking for, we begin to gain some understanding about how we might deepen our walk with God. So notice verse 17. He says that um, he keep, 
I, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You see, when he says that um, he keeps asking, it's not just a one-time ask. It's a constant, you know, um, coming before God and saying, God, we need something. These believers here, they, they need something because something is missing. That's why he says, I pray that he may give you but what is missing? They, we read in the passage from last week that having, having heard this gospel of truth and believed, we were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. But Paul is saying in this passage that we are just getting started, that the reason why we need this spirit of wisdom and revelation is because this life of faith it's all about, listen to this, it's all about transformation. And this transformation is impossible without God's assistance. It is the work of the Trinity that even makes this possible. But it's going on to say that if we're really going to grow, it will mean that we, that we have received this spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want you to pause and capture what Paul is really praying for in this text. What he's really saying is that he's praying on our behalf that we would develop this deep relationship. And in so doing, it would make life worth living. This will ensure that we develop deep roots to our faith so that we will grow strong enough to meet the challenges that we face throughout our seasons of life. Jesus understood that, and he talked about that in his early ministry. For instance, look at this passage in John 16, 5 through 14. If you're a note taker, just write down the reference. You could look it up again later. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. He says, it is good for you that I'm going away. Most people would not agree with that. I'm sure they didn't want Jesus to go away. But notice Jesus says, it is good that I go away, because unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, that's the counselor, when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. You see, so when Paul is praying to the, uh, to the Lord on behalf of these Ephesian believers, he, they need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. They need what Jesus told his disciples earlier. They need someone to guide them into truth. And they need that spirit of God to go before them to convict men of sin and righteousness and judgment so that the spirit of God, this constant inner voice within us, bearing witness to our spirit, it begins, to begin, it, it begins this conversation whereby we grow in our convictions and we become stronger and stronger in the truth of what God is saying. Can I give you one more example of this? Write down this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I just took a few of these verses here, but Paul begins by saying to the Corinthian Christians, he says, look, we do, he says, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. This wisdom that he was proclaiming, now he says in verse 9, it says, as it is written, no eye has seen, no, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Whenever I'm teaching this passage, I will normally ask people, what do you think he's talking about there when he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived? 
More times than not, people will say, oh, he's talking about heaven. But no, God's talking about wisdom, his wisdom. And he says, no one really has seen it, understood it. He says, but God has revealed it to us, how? By his spirit. So when Paul is praying that they receive, that God may give you this spirit of wisdom and revelation, is so that we can understand what it is that God has for us. Notice it goes on, it says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, because he is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. And then it goes on, and it says, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Here we are in an auditorium, and you're sitting alongside um, people, and you really have no idea what's going on inside of their heads, do you? The only one that knows what's going on inside of them is their own spirit. And that's what he's saying here. He says, no man knows what another man is thinking except for that spirit that's in him. But he goes on and says, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. You want to know something of God's wisdom and his power. You receive it through the Spirit. Notice what he says here in verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See that phrase there? He says, well, they say um, they are foolishness to him. The word foolishness is the Greek word moron, where we get moron, that which is dull, stupid. It's saying that without the Spirit of God, God's ways seem dull. It, they don't seem even possible. But when you open your life and believe this gospel, by faith you receive these things because of the testimony that has gone on for generation after generation when you go out and you look at a world that demonstrates its brokenness in so many places and people trying to find answers to it all, and God is there saying, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When, that, when you believe, you're sealed with this spirit, and Paul wants that spirit to have a wide berth in your life. That's why he prays it. He continues his prayer in verse 18. He says, I pray that also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. You see, so that you may know. Paul wants them to have something because something is missing. And now he says he wants them to know something because something is needed. And what is needed is that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened. Now, that's a nice spiritual sounding you know, phrase, but let's unpack that for a moment. This knowledge is to be exper experiential. Jesus referred to that in a text that we find in Matthew chapter 6. Listen to this. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? See, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is to, is to shed light. It's so that I don't walk in the darkness of this world, but I walk in the light of God's way. And as a result of that, Paul says, if the eyes of your heart truly see, Paul is praying that they see certain things. What is needed for them is that they would come to an understanding and now look at your notes. I bolded these there for you. It says he wants them to know the hope to which he has called them. The hope to which he has called you to know what to know God's call on the future. The latter half of the book of Ephesians, beginning at chapter 4, Paul will make this statement. He'll say that we are to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. If you understand the hope of this calling, it is going to inform the way in which you live out every day of your life. Again, here's a, there's a, a quote by uh, uh, an academic called C. Moule, 
And uh, Dr. Moule, he referred to this hope as faith that stands on tiptoes. It's a person who is looking with the assurance that he's going to find something. And now God is saying to you and me, may the eyes, Paul is praying that the eyes of their heart would be open so that they would know the hope of this calling. What is this hope about? Can I give you just a few things? Again, in Romans chapter 4, listen to this verse. I think it gets right to the point. It speaks about a hope that God is going to fulfill his promises. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. We know the story of Abraham, right? He's given a covenant that God said, I'm going to use you to become the father of, of many nations. Through you, the world is going to be blessed. But for 25 years, he and his wife were barren. Notice it says here in verse 19, it says, Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, because he was about 100, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. You see, the hope that Abraham had was a hope that God was able to fulfill his promises. So when we read these promises that God makes to us, we know that God is able to do exceeding abundant beyond all that we can think or imagine. There's something you could take to the bank. Can I give you one more about what this hope of our calling is about? Just sticking with Romans, look at Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Here we have hope in the testimony of Scripture. He says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. See, this hope was meant never to disappoint us. This hope, it says, is the veracity of what God is saying to us. And it's always going to be in contrast to what the voices of the world are saying. Because hope is always going to be found in the company of faith and of love. There's that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that outlines what is love. Love is patient, kind, not self-seeking, not you know, not envious, not proud, doesn't seek its own, keeps no record of wrongs. But at the end, it says this. It says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Because hope is always in the company of faith and love. But he goes on and says, I don't only just want you to know the hope of your calling. There's another thing that he prays that they would have some deep understanding in. And this is about the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Take a look at this passage here where it says inheritance in the saints. But notice that it's his glorious inheritance. It's not our inheritance. And, and I, I point this out because Paul is pointing to the tremendous glory that is present when God inherits the people he has set apart for himself. It is the Father's inheritance that Paul is referring to, not that of the believer. In the saints means that the inheritance is found in the people of God collectively. It's like you go to a family reunion and grandma and grandpa are, are there, and then everybody wants to get a picture with grandma and grandpa because from them, all these generations flowed. And if you come from a large family, you look around at the children you have and the children that they've had, and if, you're, if the grandparents have lived long enough, then their grandchildren are having children. And you sit there, and suddenly a room is filled with all that came from, from this one union between your grandfather and your grandmother. And in those moments, everyone takes around and thinks, like, wow, look at the blessing. Well, you see, this text is really beginning to say to us that we, he wants us to know something of this, of, of God's inheritance, his inheritance in the saints. If we had this big picture of what God was going to do when he brings us all together, it would fortify us to live this deeper walk with God. 
can I, can I tell you that this is not just going to be found personally, individually, in terms of saying, well, hey, I'm a part of God's people. No, no, this is going to be found out completely when all the saints are gathered. You know what it's going to look like? It's going to happen when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of the resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, every generation of believers from every nation, every tongue, every people, they will be there. When the roll is called up yonder, we'll all be there. And in that moment, you're going to hear the triumphant cry of the saints as they come marching in. In that day, you will see loved ones that are your treasure kept in heaven. On that day, you will smell the fragrance of perfection. You will taste the fruit of this new creation, and you will touch the hand of the one who made all things possible. On that day, you will understand something deeply of what his glorious inheritance in the saints really means. Because you will look out and see a sea of people, the cry of the redeemed. And on that day, you will fully understand the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is praying that we would not only know the hope of this calling, but we would keep in mind the end for which God is working all things for the good of those who love him. But it even goes beyond that because he wants them to know something of his incredibly great power for us who believe. God's power is without rival. He alone has designed it and executed it and applies it. His rule will be forever. God's great power, though, is going to reside in us. Do you catch that? One of my favorite passages is found in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, where he says, his divine power, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his goodness. Everything we need for life and godliness, it says his dunamis, his dynamite, his power has been given to us. And why? Because God knows that his power in us is going to transform us. And what does that look like? It means that he replaces can't with can. Weakness with strength and defeat with victory. His power not only brings transformation, it promises to make us wise so that we're not ruled by our passions, but we're ruled by his purposes. We're not blinded by the darkness around us, but we walk in the light of truth. That we learn something about what it means to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And so if something is missing and what is needed is that we would know experientially what 
his hope is, what this inheritance is, is calling us to, and what this power is all about, can I just conclude and tell you that it's so that everyone would understand that one day everything is going to be restored in him. Look at verse 19. That power, that incomparably great power that now works in you, he says, is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. There is a shift that has taken place. This resurrection of Jesus now is proof positive that the dead in Christ shall rise. And if he is our resurrection and the life, and if those who believe in him, though they be dead, yet shall they live, that means that this world is no longer the center. Now that center has moved to the heavens where now we have one who waits and beckons us to live out this life, letting your light so shine before men that they would see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. God is saying to you and to me that if we receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and if we grow in our understanding of this hope and this inheritance and this power, it will usher us one day into his presence because this life is temporal. The one to come is eternal. Because where Jesus is, notice what it says in verse 21, it's far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. The passage is clear. Whatever powers may exist in this world, they are all going to be subject to Christ. And the greatest foe, our own mortality and death is swallowed up in him. Notice it says, God placed all things under his feet, all things, and appointed him to be head over everything in the church. The point is that, the, that Christ is now the head of all things and is for the benefit of the church, his people, those that he's calling from all over the world. We have that privilege to be a part of this redemptive community. And that's why we need to flex our muscles. We need to flex that power. Because the mandates of the world is, is always kind of tit for tat. It is Jesus who comes and says, no, you got to love your enemies. The only way to overcome evil is with good. You got to hate what's evil, cling to what's good. You got to be zealous for the things of God. You have to allow vengeance to rest in the hands of God. And it's difficult. But when we live that way before the, the eyes of a watching world, you watch how men and women suddenly realize the truth of this gospel. And suddenly this light begins to shine even in the midst of darkness. Jesus is the head, which forever means that he and his body, the church, are linked forever. And notice here it says, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus is the fullness of God. He is that visible expression of what was invisible to our eye. We read about his ministry and his work, but we see that Christ is the place where, Christ, where, where God's presence and his power and his salvation is known. And the church draws from him its fullness. Can you understand now why church is so important? because it is the body by which God is going out into the world and making himself known. God says, I desire to do that, but the only way that's going to happen is if my people really understand who I am. Therefore, lean into the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Know something about this hope and inheritance. Know something about this power that is ours. We have not received the spirit of fear, but a spirit 
of power and love and self-discipline. Show the world who Jesus is. It's not meant for us to hide this in a closet. It's not meant for us to dim this light. No, no, if you name the name of Jesus, then be transformed. Allow the Spirit of God to begin to define your identity. Live a life of righteousness. Show yourself to be a son and daughter of the King. You hang on to that spirit of wisdom and revelation, and you will live a deep life, a life worth living. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for this passage. It is a reminder, Lord, couched in, in a word of prayer that we would be filled with you. That all that you have designed, that all that you are building, it would be made manifest in us so that we live life with great assurance and purpose and power. Let us love deeply from the heart that the world may know that we are your disciples. We'll be careful to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.